What a beautiful day. I'm so glad that you're all here. And for those joining online, we're glad that you're joining us as well. Uh, just before I start into the message this morning, I thought I would just say something briefly related to some of the events that occurred yesterday. I think that you probably were glued to a TV set like I was as we watched some uh, events unfold. Um, my thoughts are uh, specifically about one person and then a group of people. And uh, one person was someone who attempted to take the life of someone else and successfully did that in terms of a person that was in the audience. Uh, one person was killed, two others injured. Uh, what impressed me is that uh, when the presidential candidate went down, uh, Secret Service moved in and just blanketed themselves over him. And uh, I wonder if I would have that kind of courage. And I suspect it would have something to do with how much I love someone. You know, if it's my wife or my child, um, that's, that might be well likely. If it's someone I don't know, I don't know. The truth is, is that we have the opportunity with our words, how we use them in our culture, to be someone who is attempting to take life or someone who's attempting to preserve life. In our culture, the political dialogue has gotten rather toxic and rather volatile, and people are becoming more and more divided. If we are one nation, we must be under God. Everything else just divides. And so I would just encourage you, as you process all this information, uh, Rather than post, pray, pray. That the future of our nation needs to be determined by the prayers of God's people and not other actions in our culture, amen? amen. Father, uh, help us do that. Help us guard our lips and help the words that we speak preserve life and give life in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in a series on Galatians, and didn't uh, last week Pastor John and the week before Pastor Stephen, didn't they do an amazing job? Uh, just phenomenal. Yeah. And so Pastor John last week did the very exciting part about the acts of a sinful nature, and I get the boring job of talking about the fruit of the Spirit. You know, some people, when they hear the fruit of the Spirit, we've, we, a lot of us have been familiarized with that passage over time, and our eyes start to, start to glaze over and say, oh, you're a fruit of the Spirit. You know. why, why couldn't they talk about Samson today? You know? Well, uh, let's look at this. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us, become, let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Have you ever seen an actual masterpiece? I've seen a few in my lifetime, most always in a museum. My wife and I went to see the very famous painting called Starry Night by Van Gogh. They had it on the wall. They had an arc of a circle around it, and we were instructed that no one under any condition was to cross that line. I didn't want to find out what would happen if we did cross that line, but I can tell you what my wife did. <laughs> Susan put her toes right on the line. And then she leaned as far forward as she could. And I watched the security guard over there in the corner. He was twitching. And she wanted to get as close to the masterpiece as possible. That painting is estimated to be worth one billion dollars. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Now, I've been to a few museums, and I've seen some remarkable works of art. I've also noticed that in addition to displaying art, every museum has another thing, and it's called a souvenir shop. 
And if you really liked a painting, they will have a replica, a print of that painting that you can pick up for not a billion dollars, $20. <laughs> Even though it looks very much like the original, its value is much, much less. Why is that? Why is the masterpiece worth a billion and the copy worth only $20? And the answer has to do with the connection of the masterpiece with the master who created it. That replica has no connection with the masterpiece. It's just a print. And so Paul is talking to the Galatian church and he's very, very concerned that instead of being masterpieces of grace, they are becoming replicas. They are becoming copies. And he knows that a copy of something has very little value. They were imitating the rules of others, the regulations of others, even the mannerisms of others. And the question that is worth asking is, so what is a Christian supposed to look like? Can you tell by how they're dressed? What's a Christian supposed to sound like? Do we speak in Elizabethan English? What's a Christian supposed to present themselves like? Like, is that how you walk into the room? Just so everybody knows, I am a Christian. Paul doesn't think that that's what is supposed to go on. He, he introduces something that is a very interesting and very different concept. And what he talks about is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, he had previously talked about these random and chaotic acts of the sinful nature, but now he begins to talk about the orderly and beautiful way God's Spirit manifests in our life. And, and we'll go through these very quickly. Don't worry, we're not going to do a whole lesson on each. Love, which means to serve a person for their good and intrinsic value, not just for what we can get out of them. Our, I know our culture says that it, it's a certain kind of feeling that you have or desire that you have for someone, but Scripture actually says love is not a feeling, it's a commitment, and it's a commitment to what's best for the other person. And, and then there's joy, to delight in God and in beauty. Our culture uh, settles for elation. If I get what I want, then I'm happy for a minute. But can we delight in God and in beauty? And peace, it's a confident trust in the wisdom of God and the power of God, even though things may not be going like I want. In fact, things might be going the exact opposite of what I want. Do I trust in the wisdom of God and the power of God not only to bring me through this to survive the event, but somehow it works out for my good and God's glory? Uh, forbearance or patience, that's facing trouble without blowing up or giving up. I see a lot of blow-ups and a lot of people tapping out, and the fruit of the Spirit helps us endure things without blowing up or giving up. And then kindness, which means serving others in practical ways to help them. It's not just doing a good deed. How can I actually help this person in the situation that they are in? And goodness. Goodness, a lot of people think goodness is you just, uh, uh, you do a good deed. Goodness is being the same person in any situation. You're not one thing over here and another thing over there goodness. And then there's faithfulness, the courage to be reliable, the courage to be dependable, to do what you say you will do, to be a friend in good times and in bad. That's faithfulness. And gentleness, interacting with people in humility and without focusing on ourselves. It's not just being polite. It's interacting with people and not so that they notice us or other people notice us, that's the humility piece. I think it's, uh, C.S. Lewis talks about this a little bit. Uh, he said that uh, Christians are not supposed to think less of themselves. Christians are supposed to think of themselves less. It's like that. Self-control, pursuing the important over the urgent. Pursuing the important over the urgent. Spiritual life is not about copying others. Spiritual life is not about copying others. Rather than copying others, we could 
begin an adventure of finding the creative ways that we can live out the grace and the truth of God in our everyday lives. And that will probably look a lot different for you than it does for me. But our tendency is to copy. If all we do is copy, two things happen and we can't keep them from happening. One is we start comparing ourselves with someone and then we start competing with someone. And here's the thing, whether you're comparing or competing, the only thing you get out of that is what you want. It's very self-interest based. But there can be another way to live. And if we go after this in terms of comparing and competing, this is what's also true. You will either develop a sense of pride because the people you're comparing yourself with are doing not as well as you are, or insecurity because the people you're comparing yourself to, they're doing so much better than you and you feel there must be something wrong with you. Uh, when I was in school, we were told that if we copy someone else's paper or exam, it's called cheating. And in the Galatian church, copying someone else's approach to spirituality was somehow considered more religious. It's spiritual cheating. That's a pretty provocative thing to think about, isn't it? Uh, when I was in kindergarten, I was given an oral test by the teacher to find out whether I, I was uh, qualified to go to first grade or not. Back in those days, it wasn't an automatically assumed thing. And I remember the teacher asking me a question, and the question was, do you know what a window is made of? And what's the answer? See, that seems obvious <laughs> to you, but it wasn't to me because what I thought she was asking is, do I know what glass is made out of? I knew it was glass, but do you know what a window is made of? And I thought, what is it made of? I don't know. Where does windows come from? I don't know. In case you're wondering, I did go home and find out. And believe it or not, windows are made out of sand and a lot of heat. When it comes to our spiritual life, when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, the question might be, so what is the fruit of the Spirit made out of? And <laughs> this is what we want to do. We want to just manifest the fruit of the Spirit. Bam! Love. Bam! Self-control. Nobody wants to manifest patience. <laughs> we want other people to manifest patience. Paul is intentionally using the metaphor of fruit to teach us something about how the spirit life works in us. And, and I've actually, I owned a house in Jamestown, New York that had apple trees and pear trees. And this is what I can tell you is that the fruit of the spirit is gradual. Fruit grows gradually. You don't walk out there one morning and then the tree is just filled full of apples or pears. That's not how it works. Christianity is not a version of Jack and the Beanstalk where you plant magic seeds and by the next morning there is a stalk that rises all the way to heaven. It's like children growing in your home. You actually can't see them grow, but all of a sudden their shoes don't fit and their pants are too short and they can't button their shirts anymore. You have to make accommodations. How do we notice it in our spiritual life? We notice that, you know what? I just reacted in that situation different than I used to. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? The fruit of the Spirit is also inevitable. Um, owning apple trees and pear trees was a royal pain in the neck when the apples were falling all over the ground and I needed to mow the lawn. And if you don't know this about me, I have something like a, a counting sickness. And so every year I would count all the apples every time. And some years were more prolific than others, but there were never. One year I decided I'm just going to mow right over them. Not a good idea. <laughs> Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is inevitable. I was never surprised that something grew on those trees, and I was never surprised by what grew on those trees, because apple trees, believe it or not, with unbelievable consistency, will produce 
apples yet. Yeah. And the fruit of the Spirit has deep roots. This is important. Without roots, the tree can't produce anything. And it's far easier to focus on the fruit of something than it is to focus on the root of something. If we want to bear spiritual fruit, we have to focus on what our lives are rooted in. And if our lives are rooted in, in someone else's opinion of us, you're not going to produce spiritual fruit. If it's rooted in the status that I can obtain, the resources that I can acquire, the positions that I can own, the material things that I can have control over, you don't get spiritual fruit out of that. If that's what our life is rooted in, well, you get a lot of what we see in our world. And so it can't be rooted in that. If we do that, we just imitate stereotyped examples of religion, and we become a factory of cliches. The last thing our world needs right now is a cliche. We need some masterpieces of grace. You are not a cliche. You are actually a masterpiece. You are an original. You are a one and only. You are a member of God's family. You're not a number or a statistic. You are a son and a daughter of God. How many are glad you are a one and only of God? Yeah, absolutely. So look at what he says. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other, what is he telling us? You can't live out the life of the Spirit by comparing uh, or competing with others. We can't manage it that way. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. What are our roots connected to? What kind of fruit is being born in our lives? Now, for some people, they think the goal of Christianity is just to stop some behaviors and start other behaviors. So we look at Christians who behave a certain way or maybe dress a certain way, and then we imitate that, hoping that we are demonstrating that we are, in fact, Christian. The thing is, is that conformity does not help us live in the Spirit. Copying someone else doesn't help you live in the Spirit. The Bible says, Paul, the same person who wrote this, to the Roman church says, don't be conformed, be transformed. Conformity will not produce spiritual fruit in your life. So we have to learn to focus. And he says, how do you crucify those things? That's a, how, how does... How do we change what's going on on the inside, not just address what's going on on the outside? Because you can change some things on the outside for a while, and for some people, at least, they can only do those things that they've been doing uh, when no one else is looking, or in just certain groups of people. But how do our lives actually transform? And one of the things that we learn in Scripture is that you don't just focus on the fruit, you focus on the root. The, a good question to ask when there's something you do that you're not happy about or others in your life are not happy about. Ask yourself, not just what did I do, why did I do that? What was driving that action? What was I trying to obtain? What was I trying to prove? What was underneath it? What did I think that I needed in order to be valued or to, be, to have an identity that was worthwhile? And the thing is, is if we discover our value and our identity and our security in Christ, if other people withhold that from us, it doesn't matter to us. Oh, we might be disappointed by the way they speak to us or even exit our lives, but the simple truth is, is that once you know you are loved by the person, by the God who loves more than any other being in all of the universe, and that your identity is in him, what does it matter if someone else rejects you? So don't just focus on the what did I do? Why did I do it? Now, here's a really interesting thing, and I'd never noticed this before. I've been doing this a long time. I mean, I, I didn't walk with the Apostle Paul directly. There's, there, I just missed him. Uh, when I was in Antioch, he was on his way out. Uh, in, in 
his writing of letters, if, if you don't know this, he actually didn't write chapters and verses. That's been added later just so we can find things more quickly. And so he actually, when, when your Bible says chapter six, he's still continuing the same thought, and this is what he's going to do. He gives us, so this is what life in the spirit looks like. This is the fruit that gets born. And then he gives us three examples to creatively live out that life of the spirit. This is, this is rather amazing. Listen to what it says. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore them, restore that person gently, but watch yourselves, or you may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one, each one should carry their own load. So he gives us three examples of how to creatively live out the fruit of the Spirit that has nothing to do with copying anybody. So what's the example he gives? Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. It is so easy to condemn others for their words and actions that we don't approve of. It's so easy to, uh, to uh, convict them of things that we know are out of bounds. It's so easy to do that. Any copycat can do that, but it takes a lot of creativity to gently restore someone who has been caught in sin. By the way, that word caught doesn't just mean, oh, they got found out. That word caught means they're being controlled by this thing. They've lost options. And it feels like they're just being manipulated by something they would rather not have in their life. And Paul says, this is a great way to exercise some creativity. You don't just tell them, say these words and behave this way. They were caught in a sin. It's gained power in their life. And he says, when you're doing this, be very aware of your own tendency to be tempted. And we think that the temptation is always to do what that person did. That's not the most tempting thing. The most tempting thing is to think, I would never do that. In my experience, people who say, I would never, are the most susceptible people of doing it. A second example he gives, carry each other's burdens. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. It's very easy to criticize those who are being crushed by burdens. It takes a lot of creativity to get close and to help take up some of the weight of that burden in another person's life. And Paul says, this is fascinating to me, he says, when we do that, we actually fulfill the law of Christ. A lot of copycat religionists had a big problem with Jesus because he spent way too much time with people who are heavily burdened. And he tried to help them. Copycats don't have time for that. But how many are glad Jesus does? He comes alongside and he helps pick up the load. Jesus was highly criticized, but he still found time. We are not just here in our world to try to find masterpieces. We are here to allow God to do a masterwork in our lives. And if we do that, we begin to display his glory. All of a sudden, you're not just copying somebody. You have a connection to the master artist. That makes all the difference in the world. Third thing, each one, each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else for each one should carry their own load. I'll have the worship team come up. Carry your own load. What does that mean? That means to see that we actually have a responsibility for our spiritual life. 
And not only just in our in terms of our relationship with God, but also with others. The truth is, is that if I don't take on the responsibilities that God has assigned me, I will wind up missing the opportunities that God provides to bring grace through my life to someone else. You are an original work of grace. And God wants to do creative things in you. Our workplaces, our schools, our neighborhoods, these are real life galleries. And God is not the ultimate curator where he's trying to find the best examples to display to people. He is the ultimate creator. And what he's looking for is ways to display his glory through our lives so that wherever we go, wherever we go, our connection to the master helps other people see what a masterpiece looks like. Don't settle for copying. Let's bow our heads. Father, would you help us live our lives in such a way that we're not looking to take our cues from someone else so we can copy them, but we can stay connected to you and find creative ways to live out our relationships in our home as spouses, as parents, as children, in the marketplace, as employers and employees and entrepreneurs and in our neighborhoods with the kind of care, concern, and compassion that we show others who may be very different from us and think different from us and might not agree with us at all. You have not called us to be copycats. You are in the business of creating masterpieces. Would you help us become the canvas on which you do your mighty work of grace? In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.